Hi, this is Vernon Davis from Bedrock Games and the Bedrock Blog, and I'm here with Adam Balderstone, and we are continuing our discussion of the 2006 Return of Condor Heroes series. Uh, today we're going to be talking about episodes 19, 20, and 21, and in these episodes we continue all of the drama at Passionless Valley. Uh, Yangua and Lua are thrown into a pit by Gong Soon, and there they have to contend with some crocodiles, and then they, they discover that Lua's mother, Qian Chi, is still alive. Uh, her, uh, her tendons have been destroyed by Gong Soon, and she was thrown into this sort of underground grotto where she survived on dates, and she has uh, mastered this technique of spitting the date stones out. And so she has incredible internal energy, but she's completely crippled from head to toe. And, uh, and we also learn that she's the sister of the leader of Iron Palm Sect. And we get the background story of, of Gong Soon and Qian Chi and the different points of view that they sort of try to give yeah. on what happened. And uh, Yang Go and Lua return as the wedding's supposed to take place. There's a big battle, and basically Qian Chi destroys Gong Soon's kung fu by tricking him into drinking tea that's laced with her blood. And th he has this technique that protects all of his pressure points. And if he consumes any blood, that is completely evaporates. And so that's what she does to him. And then she spits a stone in his eye and blinds one of his eyes and he flees. And there's also a bunch of other things that happen uh, during this sequence where uh, Qian Chi discovers that one of her brothers is dead and that he was killed by Huang Rong and Gua Jing. And initially she tries to get uh, Yang Gua to uh to marry Lu or very forcefully and she threatens him with the antidote he he's already given the only remaining pill that he knew of to Zhao Long Nu and she dis reveals that the, no there's another there's another pill that I have and we'll get into that when we talk about the backstory stuff but she tries to uh convince him to marry her daughter by threatening him with the antidote and uh, she, he he refuses, and so she eventually relents and says, "Okay, bring me the heads of Huang Rong and Guo Jing, and I will I will give you the antidote." And he agrees to that. So she gives him half of a pill, which it turns out actually accelerates the 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 time that he has before he dies. So instead of thirty six days, now that he's been given only a half of the pill, he has eighteen days. And Yang Guo, Zhao Long Nu, and Jin Lun and company all head out. They go to the Mongolian camp. They find out that uh, Gua Jing and Huang Rong are in Jiangyang. They go there, and uh, Yang Guo uh, attempts to kill Gua Jing in the middle of the night and fails, and Gua Jing mistakes it for fire deviation or some kind of um, meridian issue from overtraining. And what we get in, in, in over the course of the episode following this is Yang Guo sort of slowly coming to respect Gua Jing and seeing... Uh, and he's sort of having to deal with this conflict of he believes Guo Jing killed his father or, or him and Huang Rong are responsible. But he also is seeing that Guo Jing is actually a really exemplary figure who is protecting Zhang Yang and giving him, uh, basically explaining to him what a real hero is. And yeah. the episode ends with Guo Jing uh, as he's defending Zhang Yang from the Mongolian uh, invasion, falling off the, uh, the wall of the city uh, into a, a sea of Mongolian spearmen, and and Yang it's pretty clear that Yang is basically making a choice: do I save Guo Jing or do I let him fall to his death? And that's and we end on a cliffhanger. And so I don't know, did I miss anything important in the overview there, or was that everything? Uh you. The only thing I notable thing you missed, I think, is the the point where where he decide where Yang Guo decides, you know, well, forget it. I'm just going to spend these 18 days with you, and we're not going to go go kill anyone. I don't want to go kill anyone. So that there's kind of that little interlude there, but yeah. that. Uh, yeah, because there is that moment when he's talking with Zhao Long Nu, and he basically says like, "I don't really want to kill them. I just want to spend my time with you." And she's like, "I'll do whatever you want." Like, you know, we'll get, you know, she's pretty, she's pretty easygoing on this issue, and 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 it's and it's like a very prolonged scene. Like, there's a lot of number one, they yeah. play they play a new section of music that I don't think we've really heard much of, but it's related to the opening theme. It's this, it's definitely the same singer. I don't remember this name of this particular song, but it's another song on the soundtrack. And it's 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 a little bit more I don't know ethereal or something, but it, it's it's becoming important uh, in the background. And so there's just a lot of these lingering scenes with them to kind of emphasize 
that they're in love. And I think one of the things that, that really works about both the story and when it's depicted in the shows is their constant their constant separation and reunion makes makes the like like they're sort of the iconic heroic couple of uh you know like like they're like like they're like you know the the real truly in love you know uh martial figures in wuxia and i think one of the reasons why that sort of echoes so effectively is because of the way that they're the separations are so important to having Mm -hmm. these these sort of oases that you get of them actually being together um and so it's just very effective uh and it's something i don't know is it has it has it established a pattern in your mind yet of them sort of constantly? Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. 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 There's definitely a pattern there. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting contrast from what I saw of, uh, of Guo Jin and, and Huang Rong, where they basically, you know, they, they, they had a relatively easy time of it as a couple, as far as, uh, like from what I've seen, I mean, I, I don't know the whole story. But, well, uh, in the book, it's a, and in and in uh, and in some of the drama series, it's 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 a little bit more. I mean, it's definitely more straightforward than Zhao Longnu and Yang They they have it the roughest, I think. But yeah, but well, yeah, I guess I don't say they had it easy, but relatively easy. <laughs> but one of the one of the plot points they leave out of Brave Archer is uh, is Guo Jing's betrothal to the to the daughter of Genghis Khan. And, okay. and that is a very difficult thing to, for him to get out of, especially because he's trying to be honorable about it. And so he's not just mm-hmm. like, OK, well, you know, there's there's a great scene where where uh, Huang Yaoshi finally sort of agrees to the marriage between uh, Huang Rong and Guo Jing. And I think he says something like, why don't you just keep just kill her? Just, you know, just kill her and be done with it. And, you know, you two can get married. I, I forget exactly, but I think, I think, and I don't remember if it was the book or a show that I might be confusing with the, with the book, but, but, uh, but it ends up being an important plot point. And, and so it's also why you're supposed to sort of understand, like, there's a little bit, there's like a little tone of hypocrisy with Guo Jing and Huang Rong being all judgmental about Xiao yeah. Long Nu and, in in uh yango now yango and jia long new are definitely breaking new ground like they're they're they're, they're you know they're, this is a much more extreme sort of violation of the norms that that everybody's in whereas gua jing and huang rong were they were essentially just trying to marry who they wanted to do you know what i mean they weren't they, they yeah so the only rule that they were breaking was that they were not abiding by the will of their parents maybe or people who had made arrangements whereas Yango and Zhao Long Nu are really egregiously just kind of breaking this major taboo. Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah, so I don't know. The I, for me, the, the I think the best part of this section of the show and of the book is uh, Qian Chi. Um, I I think yeah. that she's like a a really <laughs> marvelous character. Um, and I don't know. I I was curious what your take on her was. If you if, you know. Uh, just what impression well, she made. Yeah, I mean, she, she's an interesting character because her initial reaction, my initial reaction is, you know, a lot of sympathy for her and stuff. And then you're like, the more you get to know her, you're like, wow, she's, you know, so she's pretty bitter, which yeah. is understandable. Then it goes from bitter to, wow, she's pretty evil. And it's, it just, just kind of keeps expanding. And it's, it's, uh, you feel, you feel really bad for, uh, for, uh, uh her daughter. Cause, uh, it's it's just like okay well she had this evil father but now she's found her mother and oh wait 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 now her mother's pretty evil too so i will say one thing in chian chi's defense her love of her daughter seems a lot more sincere than gong soon's love of it because he's already attempted to kill her twice by the end of this uh (laughs) uh, you know which i mean he's just just he is not winning father of the year anytime soon um no she, no she's not she's not 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 vile on the same level by any means i mean uh, you, you were telling me last time when i was talking about uh how evil gone soon was and uh you're like oh just wait just wait and <laughs> yeah yeah i didn't didn't have to wait long <laughs> it's uh yeah he's just just terrible <laughs> terrible human being in in every way (laughs) he he has one redeeming quality though again this is sort of a suspect redeeming quality which is his love of rua who he killed he killed because he he thought he kind of had to do it um so his love only went so far but it seems like he's genuinely upset about that happening to him 
and that he was <laughs> he was you you know like so the backstory and it's funny the way that we we learn it because uh, Gong Soon explains to Zhao Long Nu like his history and he paints it in this really sympathetic light where like oh I'm a widower and my wife was sick and she died and it, and then and but then that's being cut and contrasted with Tian Chi's explanation of what happened and they couldn't be more different in in their characterizations of events and basically yeah. what she tells uh Yangua and uh and Lua is that uh you know she had she had she was a few years older than Gong Soon and you know she was it sounds like she was madly in love or infatuated with him and they married uh and he was basically using her to get her kung fu to get her martial arts and he ended up having an affair with one of her maids and she had them both thrown into a a passion flower patch and then she destroyed all of the pills and said that there was only one and that she she would let them choose who got to have it and gong soon does something really tricky he he tells uh, Rua, he says, let's let's die together and rejoin each other in hell. And she agrees to this, thinking that he's truly in love with her. And he stabs her and says, OK, now give me the pill, please. And 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 then, you know, she reveals, oh, she actually had two pills. She just wanted to make them squirm. And yeah. she's actually pretty surprised that he was, you know, willing to do this to her. And <laughs> and uh and, and but then he but then he's like no no I'll be a good husband I'm gonna you know I'll you know let's 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 you know I'll, I'll obey I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna be much more dutiful now you're right and he just bides his time and then poisons her with some kind of paralytic venom and then throws her into the grotto after he destroys her tendons which is just the classic way you you destroy somebody's kung fu in in wuxia um, and and so she's been she's just been living inside this cave on her own helplessly uh for for quite some time 18 years yeah. i think was yeah. the count yeah yeah because yeah, well, happened... 17 i guess because she was about a year, her daughter was about a year old at the time so 17 yeah because he, he had this affair when when lua was a was a baby so uh, yeah so i don't know i thought it was a very impre- again in the book it's a little bit different and we get a little bit more depth to the backstory but i thought they did a really good job doing that cutting between the two accounts of what was what had happened um, they did another thing i liked about that whole sequence too is is just jow long news expression through the whole story it's like he's weaving this story oh woe is me my heartbreak and it's like she's kind of like looking at him like why why do you expect me to feel any sympathy for your tragic love story right now it's kind of the basic expression on her face well and what's, <laughs> and what's really amusing about it is is, is he is he says so you see the reason that i need to marry you is because you resemble Ruar, uh, or not Ruar, my, my, my <laughs> wife, my dead wife. And, uh, and so I'm just, and so she's like, well, if you were dutiful, you would just have somebody make a statue to her and you would, you know, and, and you would, and you would honor her that way. You wouldn't force somebody to marry you. I should say though, Zhao Longnu is not, um, uh, depleted of sympathy for him. She still has, like, she still okay. has a certain amount of sympathy for him, uh, because he saved her and she still feels some sense of, uh, of duty yeah there. but she's yeah. not she's not like you know you know she's not she doesn't want to marry him and she definitely is is willing to fight with him to to prevent that from happening but she you know we'll see as the things go on she doesn't she doesn't wish him you know a thousand years of misery or anything like that yeah like, uh, i didn't feel like there was hatred radiating for Ryan, but there was just this deep kind of uh I know, skepticism, you know, in her eyes, listening to this story to an extent. I mean, it's just like what <laughs> it, it just it wasn't, you know, like it wasn't wasn't winning her over at all. <laughs> and, and, and I liked when uh, Qian Chi basically crashes the wedding and then takes over the sect. Like she just she just yeah. reestablishes control, and and Gong Soon is out, <laughs> and she's now the the new head of of Passionless Valley. Um, so it tells you a lot that they that, that the disciples just very quickly switch sides like that. They, she must have had, she must be somebody that they had learned to fear and obey. If uh, yeah, if they if they just converted this quickly, because um, she kind of comes out of nowhere and is like, "Hey, I'm back after all these years." So, um, so yeah, the the other big thing that happens this uh, this episode is. Yang Guo has a has a couple of opportunities to kill Guo Jing, and he also gets confirmation about what happened because he listens in. Uh, Huang Rong uh, calls out Guo Jing in the middle of the night. Yang Guo is going to be sleeping in the same bedroom with him, 
and she's like look i don't trust him he's been acting really weird ever since he came which is true like he's he's yeah. not he's not he's not at ease he's definitely like he he doesn't like you can tell if he, he if he's gonna kill these people he doesn't want to just like unwind and act like he's you know like there's a barrier uh with you yeah at least he, he rejects like any of the any of the praise people give him or the thanks and stuff it's like oh it's nothing it's like he doesn't he just doesn't want to it's like he, he's gonna feel bad about this to an extent no matter what and he doesn't want to ingratiate himself any more than he needs to it's and, uh and and uh Gua Jing is sort of like i just don't see it i don't know what you're talking about she's like no he's acting funny <laughs> And 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 Guo Jing just he just has this uh, uh, like exuberant loyalty now to 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 Yang Guo. He's like a yeah. like he's just uh, and he feels bad about how he treated him before. And and he and and so so he just isn't he he just not buying it. Uh, and he, and then and then Guo Jing exp- they sort of have a conversation about what happened. And Guo Jing is like, well, why should we be afraid? We didn't you know we're not responsible. And she's like, no, well we didn't directly do anything, but he died when he hit my poison needle vest. And so, you know, you could say that we're responsible and, and Yango is watching this whole time. And so, yeah. so now Yango has the confirmation he needs. And in the middle of the night, he's sleeping next to Gua Jing and he tries to stab Gua Jing and Gua Jing awakens right away. And, and, and he doesn't, he sees Yango attacking him and his first thought isn't, oh, you're trying to kill me. It's, oh, you must have fire deviation. You, you've been training too hard and you've overexerted <laughs> yourself. And now you've been driven crazy because your, 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 your internal energy is all messed up. And so he starts trying to, uh, um, so he tries to, he tries to, uh, repair Goa Jing's meridians and he, he does some kind of energy blast and kind of suspends him in the air. And, and again, we hear that music that I was talking about at this time. Um, and I thought it was very interesting. There's also a really cool scene, and this doesn't really match what I remember from the book, but I could be misre- misremembering. But if I, if I understood what they were doing in the scene, Guo Jing is sort of having this internal dialogue, in it, not Guo Jing, uh, uh, Yang Guo is having an internal dialogue as he's contemplating whether he's going to kill Guo Jing when Guo Jing's vest, I think, gets caught over his head. Yeah. And, and it starts out as Zhao Long Nu, right? Like a Zhao Long Nu's voice saying, I'll be with you forever. Yeah, it was a bunch of different. Yeah, yeah. yeah and and yeah. then it turned into Shagu, basically describing the death of Yang Kang. And, and, and it becomes yeah. increasingly hysterical. And I thought it was a really interesting weave of, of conversation in his mind because I think they might have been using the same voice actress for Zhao Long Nu and, and Shagu. I'm not sure. Um, oh, okay. but, but it sounded very similar. It just sounded like she was suddenly speaking at a higher pitch or something. Um, yeah, it was subtle. I, I think there may have been a third voice in there, but I can't remember you're who prob- it was. You're probably right. I, it was very, it was a very, it was a very sort of, I don't know, a very effective way of just getting all of his internal confusion to the yeah. audience. Um, yeah, it took me a moment to catch on. I'm like, Oh wait, wait, we're hearing multiple people here. Well, but, uh, well, I like that it starts out with Zhao Long News saying, like, well, you know, I'll be with you forever. And it's just like all this sort of comforting stuff. And then it gets more and more hysterical as the, you know, and it, it just, I don't know, it was, it was, I thought it was very effective. Um, it was. And, uh, but yeah, I uh, have to say, though, that him, him going with the method of trying to stab, uh, you know, Jingo in his sleep. It's, uh, I was just like, man, come on. Is that the way you're going to do it? Well, you know? So here's the thing, though. There was a line where Zhao Long Nu was like, look, I'm really afraid of going up against Huang Rong and Guo Jing because they're oh, not sure. like nobodies. And, and I think that's like a really important point. These are the heroes from the previous book. So they've, they've both attained a level of martial arts that is terrifying. And, yeah. and Gore probably isn't up to he's not up to the task like in a fair fight Guo Jing would defeat him I think at this stage oh I agree um, I agree it's just still I don't know it just, it's just you just you just couldn't you didn't like that he he pulled the uh, sneak attack in the sleep on him. yeah it's a little yeah it, it is it is, it is I think underhanded um, but also I think we're getting Yang Gore he's sort of developing as a person right now and a lot of the dialogue he's having with Goa Jing is Goa Jing saying, look, this is what a real hero is. And, yeah. And Yang Guo is, is really kind of hearing this for the first time, I think. So um, and, and, you, and we'll see as this sort of plays out, 
like it's gonna it's it, it's almost annoyingly long how long it takes Yangor to sort of see all of this but you know but 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 you you but what we get here is a lot of examples of Guo Jing really demonstrating the virtues that he's trying to embody and so when the Mongolians attack the city I think the general who's in charge of the city I can't remember his name but in the book he's a very important character and he's kind of a slime ball and he's basically like the Mongols are doing this thing where they 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 push in front of them a throng of of song refugees who are seeking entrance into the city and they're basically using them as a shield and they're also using them as a way to wedge so that they can get into the city and attack and the general is like no don't let them in fire your arrows just fire like i know we're going to kill people but you know it's it's the most effective way to protect the city and gorging yeah. is like no no we're not going to do that because the only reason we're defending the city is we object to the mongolian atrocities and and like you know we're not, you know yeah. we're we're fighting to, to protect the song people so we're not going to kill song people to do this and it, it's a very it, and this is a i think this exchange is pretty much line for line from the book they take a few liberties but it's the same kind of exchange that he has and then he goes he basically charges out and fights and one of the things I really like about this scene is you get a sense of in a world where you have martial heroes and you have soldiers, how soldiers are still relevant, but what power level a hero contributes to like an actual battle. Um, and I don't know if it was, I thought, I thought it was pretty clearly laid out here, but maybe you, you'll object. I don't know. Um, but I think you just get this sense of Guo Jing is going out there and he's taking out tens of men at a time. Um, yeah. But he he can't just defeat the Mongolian army on his own. Do you know what I mean? He still needs soldiers. Yeah. He still needs other heroes. Um, but he's a true force to be reckoned with, and the Mongolians respect that. Um, so I don't know. It's just something about you know. I I I I feel like this is a really good story and a and a really good presentation of the story in terms of how to imagine that, especially for purposes of things like a game where. You know, you'll have mm -hmm. these characters that are super powerful. And it even would work in like a and d type context outside of Wuxia, where you have these characters that are above and beyond normal humans. Just anything that even approaches a vaguely mythic or superhero level. Um, but again, you know, there's still, you know, tactics still matter. Soldiers still matter. Um, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, I mean, if nothing else, too, I mean, there's just... Heroes are limited. You can only be in so many places at once, too. It's like you need you need some kind of force, larger force projection. But uh, yeah, I, I think the scene got it across pretty well. It, it worked for me. Yeah, they're kind of like the tanks. They're like the tanks in the battlefield. Yeah, in a way. exactly. If you send the tank out by itself, it's not going to do too well. Well, and you'll see. I mean, we got some sense of it here because Gua Jing ends up in a cliffhanger situation where he's falling off the wall and he's in peril. Um, mm -hmm. But you'll see in future battles where where martial heroes are getting wounded, how you know attrition will take its toll on them. Like just like the the you know if they if they're fighting too long, they, they'll eventually get worn down, and they'll 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 you know they they, they can only fight so many men, and they kind of start to quantify it as the at least in the book. I don't remember if they do it in this series, but they quantify it by number. Um, and uh, and yeah, so I don't know cliffhanger. We get we get a lot of cliffhangers <laughs> in these shows. I th I thought it was. Uh, I, I find it refreshing that you get that. Like, I mean, pretty much every episode ends on a, some kind of cliffhanger. Um, yeah, you know. generally, I mean, there, some are softer and some are harder than others, but yeah, there's always some kind of thing you're waiting for at the end. And, and when this story was originally written, it appeared in a, uh, in a newspaper and it was like, mm -hmm. a period, you know, so, and you kind of get, when you read the book, it's been revised. So that it's more structured like a novel, I think. And I've never read the original newspaper version. So I don't know. I've read, you know, translations of versions one and three, I think. Um, but the, uh, the thing that's nice about it is you can kind of see that you can see how this was derived from that format. There's definitely the newspaper medium is still kind of visible in the story. Yeah. And I don't know, it works. It, it like keeps you wanting to, you kind of want to keep reading because you're sort of, you know, you keep coming on these little cliffhangers, at the, you know, at the... Well, they're, they're, they're good cliffhangers too, for the most part. I mean, I, I don't think any of them have been particularly cheap. I mean, to go with another show you review, like classic Doctor Who, mm -hmm. they have to do a cliffhanger every episode. And there's so many cliffhangers in that show where it's like, it turns out to be nothing. It's like, 
oh, you know, it's just like it'll, it'll create some big threat. And then, you know, like there'll be like one Sarah J will be falling off a platform. And then, then she just catches the next poll at the beginning of the next episode. Yeah. And you're like, well, OK, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess with cliffhangers, like, if you just kind of hand wave them at the beginning of the next episode, it can be cheap. I mean, here, obviously, it's going to be resolved at the beginning of the next episode because he's falling. So, you know, they're... Yeah, but, well, but the, it's it's a momentous it's a dramatic decision. thing. It's got the character thing of, of, of Yang Gao watching him falling and will Yang Gao react is, uh, is a big element of it. So there's, it's not just, it's not just will he fall. There's, there's, there's emotion to it. And yeah. Character. Yeah, I would agree, um, and I, I think I think the cliffhangers in this show do work very well, and I like that they they have like a, a spectrum, like you're sort of describing, where some of them are softer. Um, so sometimes yeah. it'll just be like, oh, a character you weren't expecting to be there is there, and that's kind of the cliffhanger, and and, and it's not particularly perilous for anybody. It just adds like a maybe a minor note of drama to the scene, um, and then some are like this, where the character's literally falling to their death. And you don't know what's going to happen. Um, but yeah, I don't know. But, but again, for me, the standout in these, these episodes is Qian Chi. She takes the prize of <laughs> best, best character ever. Um, I don't know. There's, I, I, this is sort of a trope in Wuxia, but it's one of my favorite tropes. Just these, the, the sort of the grannies of the martial world really yeah. are the shining stars of a lot of these like and and i think the best person who handles them is gu long he has a number of just really fabulous martial granny characters but uh but but i would file her under this category of she's a a really eccentric vicious uh you know granny like character who i don't know just she's She's so terrible and, and embraces her horribleness so fully that it's almost it's almost endearing. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, well, she's she well, yeah, she's a character you really enjoy having on the screen there. I mean, yeah, it's like yeah, there's I mean, she's doing things you don't like, but you, you know, I can't, I want to see more of her in the show. And and I do think she's got this redemptive aspect of she's very sincere to her daughter. Um, and that adds, mm-hmm. a, that adds a lot to, cause like all the, a lot of the horrible stuff she's doing is because she wants her daughter to have a happy life. So when she's trying to force yeah. Yangor to marry Lua, she's like, I just want what's best for you. Why are you like, you know, you know, cause, cause Lua objects to this. She doesn't want Yangor to have to be forced to marry her. Um, and so she, she's, uh, you know, she's like, I just want what's best for you. Why can't you see that? And she's, she's weeping as she's, she's explaining this to Lua. And and it's kind and it's also it's sort of Lua is like got a very tragic arc. She's one of the characters that you just feel the worst for over the course of the story, and she has so many um, likable qualities that mm-hmm. if 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 Chianchi could just sort of stop for one moment and realize, oh, it's going to be very easy to find her a husband. She's not going to be miserable because she's huh. basically a good person. She's pretty. And she's got like, you know, she's got like a lot of, you know, good qualities as a character. So like, it's not, she's yeah. not going to be a hard person to find a husband for, but because Chianchi is so bent on having her marry Yango at this moment, she's just dragging everybody down in a direction yeah. that they don't have to go. Um, though she does eventually relent and, and agrees to to save Yang Guo if he if he beheads Huang Rong and Guo Jing, so um, yeah, hey, that's not so bad. But uh, <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's interesting you're taking that angle too because you know I mean the letter the letter where she hears the bad news is also the letter from her brother saying, oh, I'm repenting on my way. So it's almost like accepting, yeah, they were right. And but she, her whole interpretation is those people must die. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 yeah that's, <laughs> yeah, we, we completely glossed over that. Yeah, because this is, this is written by the leader of Iron Palm Sect after he's become a monk and is trying to make up for all the horrible stuff he's done. Because he, he's the guy who killed a baby in its crib. He's, he's yeah. probably the worst, like he, He's committed the worst crime imaginable of anybody, I think, in the whole series, with with one or two possible competitors for that for that position, um, and 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 he feels remorseful for it, and and she's completely missing the point of the letter, and <laughs> and is and is like you know she's she's hell bent on revenge. So, um, but again, you, you we'll see when when they deal with um, when they deal with uh, he's now Monk Chi when they deal when they deal with. Uh, when they deal with his character, 
it's it's very interesting sort of how uh how how characters like him are viewed in this setting and you can sort of understand why Qian Chi might dismiss sort of sort of the the, the actual thrust of the letter but um yeah, yeah. I, I you know I, it, she's not her motivation isn't completely out of line but uh it's uh it's just it, it's just a, a bit of irony to it that's all and, and uh, uh and, but yeah, and of course it's 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 interesting providing this additional additional weight to uh, the revenge story because uh, it would have it would have been fairly easy for Yang Guo to go back on thinking about things if he, if he saw all the things we've seen him see in the, the last episode. You know, it would have been very easy for him to let go of the vengeance, but the show just gave him well, the book gives him this additional additional uh, motivation that he can't shake off so easily and uh and another thing that that uh is worth mentioning i'm going to spoil a little bit of stuff that's coming up but i think it's i think this you'll i think you'll tell me it's so obvious that i'm not really spoiling anything but there's mm-hmm. a scene where guafu asks to see yango again and and when we when we meet her and the Wu brothers they're still sort of in their the dynamic they've always kind of been in, um, which will play out over upcoming episodes. <laughs> but, but I think that you see sort of the first sign of something that's very, it's not really directly addressed until much later, but Guafu clearly has complicated emotions towards Yango. And I feel like we're starting to kind of clearly see that in this scene where she is shown to sort of be admiring him. Um, I don't know if that was, terribly obvious. In, in what scene there was a scene where it was just a brief scene where uh during the feast when yang Gua returns and he's eating with Gua jing and yeah. Gua fu comes in and and, and there's yeah. some mention of how she asked to see yang Gua. um and 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 i think you know I, one of the interesting things about her character that we learn later on is that she has she has this like really deeply deeply buried affection for yang Gua. And uh-huh. it sort of comes out in all these really horrible ways, but <laughs> it's it, it's rooted in in admiration that uh, that she can't even recognize herself. Do you know what I mean? It's a uh, it's yeah. that deep. Um, but I thought I thought there was a flash of it here, which is why I mentioned it. Um, but maybe I was wrong. Maybe I'm maybe I'm just projecting future knowledge onto. I yeah I I didn't pick up on it. I'll say that much. I I can't say if there was something okay. there or not. But I I it didn't it it didn't pick up on. She just kind of seemed cold to him during the uh, the scene to me. But you know, I wasn't looking for it. But uh, yeah the uh, but. Yeah, I, I, I gotta admit, I, I, no, it, it, but yeah, I, I, it'll be interesting to see where that goes. Her getting to take part in the battle and everything. But uh, well, we're gonna get more of Guafu and the Wu brothers as the show progresses. So they, okay. they do become much more important. Like they've been sort of on the periphery, um, but they haven't been as central. And you know, they, they'll never take center stage the way a lot of other characters are, but they are crucial. Um, and. I don't know. I, I really one of the things I really loved about this episode was just the way that Goa Jing is just so trusting of Yang Gua. And and I and I mm-hmm. like watching the dynamic that's playing out between him and Huang Rong, where Huang Rong is immediately picking up on like everything. Um, yeah. And Goa Jing is just not. I know we kind of covered it, but I think it's worth its own discussion because, again, these are really defining traits of both characters that go back to their first, you know, when we first meet them in the, in the first story. And, 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 I, and I like that we're sort of getting the older, more matured versions of these aspects of, these, of their personalities. Um, yeah, yeah. But it's, it all makes him such a tough target for, you know, this, this underhanded revenge. He is such a trusting and kind and generally decent person on the whole it's just like you really you really couldn't be assigned a worse person that you just have to cold-bloodedly murder yeah. you you have to be a true <laughs> bastard to to kill to kill Gua Jing in, in yeah in, you know it's a it's it's a real i mean they're definitely sending you all the signals you need to know this is not a person that a virtuous person murders um but but Yang Gua is torn because he does he gets confirmation that they're responsible for his father's mm-hmm. death and he doesn't know the extent of his father's crimes at this point. Everybody's been pretty vague about yeah. you know what I mean like he asks Gua Jing and Gua Jing is kind of like 
you know, in the book, it's a little bit even more vague, but, but he still is sort of like, well, you know, your father brought, you know, he basically killed himself, like, and, and good, and Yang goes like, no, that's, that's a lie. I know it. And, and good sure. is like, look, I can't explain it in like a single sentence. I'll tell you, you know, later, like, we'll, we'll, we'll have a real conversation about it later. And he's just not getting any clarity on, 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 on his father. So he's able to fill that void with his own imagination and so i don't know if we really see it in the show but in the book he's really kind of built up his father as this hero in his mind and yeah. and that's that's a lot of what is motivating him is that that image that he constructs of his father that definitely i mean even even in brave archer they don't they don't show you the full extent of yang kong but i think you got a good sense of you know he's not a not a nice guy um, not admirable definitely <laughs> um, so yeah so uh so I don't know. Was there anything that we we didn't uh, cover uh, that you wanted to mention, or? Ah, uh, let's see. I think that pretty much covers it. I, I I can't think of a particular topic off my top of my head here. Okay. So um, so yeah. So we are uh uh you know. I guess we'll 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 be back again with a, with another episode to talk about Return of Condor Heroes. Uh, this Friday, we're going to be doing another Wuxia Weekend, and we'll be talking about Painted Skin, which I'm really looking forward to. I, I think this is like a very interesting movie. Uh, we're going to be doing Painted Skin, The Resurrection. We'll do Painted Skin, the original, at a later time. I want to I wanna do that one when people have a chance to read the short story and kind of, you know, because that one really is more connected to the original short story. This one goes in a much different direction, and it's almost its own movie as a result, so I'd like to do them separately but i just want to let people know that uh we have a bunch of um uh reward platforms and a patreon page and so if people want to support wuxia weekend uh you know they can they can they can uh go to our patreon which i'll link to and there there are multiple levels there's a one dollar level at the at the three dollar level you get to suggest movies that we add to our backlist at the $5 level, you get to vote to help us determine our fourth film every month. At the $10 level, you get to vote in order to uh, help us determine what theme we're going to have. And if you if you go up to the $15 level, then you get to suggest uh, uh, late-night movie reviews that I have to do. Uh, and, and those are kind of a, an interesting, fun thing I do on the podcast. And then at the 20th, uh, sorry, the $20 level... Um, will uh you know you can suggest a movie that we'll review once a year so so there's all kinds of different options on the patreon page and wuxia weekend we talk about movies and we generally do about 70 percent wuxia and 30 percent kung fu modern action film and a few other subgenres. so again uh we'll be back on and we will talk to you later